A frog goes into a bank and goes up to the teller, young lady teller, and the lady's name is Patty Whack. Patty Whack. So the frog says, hi, Patty Whack, my name's Kermit. Kermit Jagger. Mick, dad, Mick Jagger's my dad. And I've come for a loan. Ah, she said, interesting. Um, he said, yeah, but my dad knows everybody here. And she said, well, we need a little bit of collateral. We'd like to leave a little bit of a collateral, then I'll, I'll go and see the manager. So he pulled out a tiny little porcelain, beautiful little white porcelain elephant and gave it to her as collateral. She left, thought, who's this wacko frog? Goes well, to see the bank manager. The bank manager said, oh, yeah, 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 okay. He said, uh, he said it's a, it's a knickknack, paddywhack. Give the frog a loan. His old man's a rolling stone. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> I got a Kindle. You know the Kindle? Yeah, yeah. And I just get all these silly books like blonde jokes and frog jokes and So do you you re you do you, are you I'm, a big book reader? I am now. Did you always want to be a cinematographer or was there something else? I didn't know what the word cinematographer meant and I'd been shooting television and news for about a year in the country in, uh, in South Australia. I, was a, I started as a props boy at a television station. I was only 16. I had no experience in editing at all. I hadn't even seen television in the country. I hadn't seen it. We couldn't get it. If you, if you put up a 100-foot aerial, you could get a very snowy image, and some people with money did that, but um, so you we didn't. So you had not seen Hadn't seen it. I applied for a job as a props 16. boy. Mm -hmm. And this was Rupert Murdoch's, one of his first television channels in Australia. Channel 9 in Adelaide, and they'd just started. They were like, they'd only been open for like five or six months. And a uh, few people had been trained in the other cities. A few people had travelled to America to get basic training, but there weren't many. Mm -hmm. And they were then there to teach anybody who was willing and showed any sort of potential at all to become part of the team as a camera people, sound people, editors, direct, whatever. And so I got in on the ground floor as, uh, as a props boy. And uh, I was doing studio camera within a year. But just promotions came clear. There was nobody there to, 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 to who knew anything. Uh, so the um, promotions came very quickly if you showed any incentive. And I used to watch the um, the news cameramen come in every afternoon with their 16 mil cameras, their IMOs with 100 foot rolls of film and their light meters hanging around their neck. They looked so cool, those guys. I thought one day, and I was lucky enough to get a position in the news department within about three or four years being there. I think I was 19 when I got a job as a news cameraman and I had no idea how to expose what aperture was, what anything was, lenses. And uh, I had two mentors who helped me slowly, but there wasn't a training period. I was kicked out to the street by the news editor and said, you work it out as you go. Get out there and shoot it. So I did and I found enormous freedom. Uh, in, and, and, and responsibility in having to tell a story, you know, whether it was a murder or an opening of a building or a, you know, a flower show or a whatever, or, 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 you know, the Beatles came to Australia and I covered their tour, covered their concert, interviewed with them and stuff and I found it just wonderful to be able to tell a story in pictures. I think it was about two years and I heard the word cinematographer. I went, wow, that's a big word. But there it was. We were city cameramen down there, they used to call city. us. Ah. And I did a... Um, I wanted to go beyond doing news when I was at Channel 9. And the Tourist Bureau in South Australia uh, used to make 16mm colour films to promote the state, to, to show overseas and embassies, etc. And they'd, they'd um, advertise for a city cameraman. They had one, they were looking for another. I thought, wow, to be able to shoot colour, to be able to shoot documentaries instead of news. I mean, with news, I was, I was very proudly getting three news stories in one 100-foot roll. It's about 30 feet each. And you're just disciplined to do that. But to go out and shoot documentaries where you might shoot four or five or six hundred or a thousand feet of colour film. So I applied for a job at the Tourist Bureau when it came up, thinking I didn't have much of a chance because there were other big dogs out there who were going to get it above me. I was a fledgling. You know? An opportunity came when the Tourist Bureau opened a new office in the city. 
And the boss of Channel 9 said to the news editor, you've got to cover this. I've promised the head of the Tourist Bureau that we'd cover it for our six o'clock news tonight. So the news editor said it. Oh, yeah, I'll do it. I'll cover it. I'll go and cover it. So I was like a, like a kid who had the right answer, you know. So I went into the Tourist Bureau. It was the official opening. Then the mayor and all the dignitaries and country mayors and head of police fired about They're all, you know. And I, I took great care with a tripod and lights to, to fill the, the official opening of this tourist bureau. I made sure I filmed the two guys who were going to interview me, and I got careful light readings on them, and I got my meter, and I did the whole dog and pony show, you know? I had it. I knew, I had felt, felt so good. Thank you very much, I left. Went back to the uh, office, and the news editor said, how'd you go, Dino? I said, fantastic. I think I've, I opened the camera and I hadn't loaded it. I hadn't put any film in there at all. So I shot all of that stuff. I had that great act, that great shot, <laughs> with no film in the camera. So the news editor burst out laughing. He just rolled around on the floor, as did the rest of the news department. And I was so humiliated and so pissed off. And uh, finally I laughed as well. I mean, there's nothing you can do. And until he said, you've got to go back and cover it. I have to do it for the boss. So I went back and made some lame excuse and obviously didn't ever get the job. <laughs> I applied for a job in Sydney as a city cameraman for the news department. And um, God knows I got it for some reason. I got it in Sydney, which was the biggest television station in Australia. Now I'm now 22 or something. And I'm, I'm, this is the bee's knees. I'm, uh, this is fantastic. You know, now there's a, there's a stable of like a dozen cameramen. There's drama. That's where Johnny Seal was working as a camera operator in a drama. I moved in towards news documentaries. And he moved towards drama. Don McAlpine had just finished working there and had taken up a position at the Commonwealth Film Unit uh, as head cameraman. Right, so there was Johnny Seal was there, I was there. There was another Australian there called David Brill who became a legendary wartime cinematographer. And he's still alive, I've spoke to him recently. He's covered wars, you name it, everywhere. He's got a famous, famous story, old Brilsey. He was shooting in Vietnam with the South Vietnamese. And the South Vietnamese commander had just ordered his tanks to go forward to start the war in this particular area, to start an assault. And the tanks were starting to move and the thing. David had a, a CPR camera, a CPR 16, and it jammed. And he thought, shit, fuck, he said, stop the war, stop the war, yabba, 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 yabba. And the colonel or general said, stop, 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 and they stopped all the tanks. David reloaded his camera, got another magazine out, said, okay, I'm ready to start again, roll. Okay, start the war again. <laughs> well, I only did about six months of news, and then I was chosen. Once again, why I don't know, I was chosen to do a very prestigious documentary uh, covering the journey of Captain Cook, who discovered Australia, etc. And that meant travelling all throughout the Pacific, you know, Samoa and Tonga and Fiji, anywhere he ever touched land and met people, you know, Vancouver, London, etc. Um, and it was like about a four month journey uh, with a small group of us, and I was selected to do that, uh, you know, above these veteran cameraman who'd been there for a long time, so I was doing all right, you know. It's funny because we travelled Qantas, and that it was Qantas co-sponsored the whole documentary for our bicentenary. Um, and um, we'd been travelling like every three or four days, we'd be on another Qantas plane, and we'd be off to somewhere, and it'd be Captain Cook this, and it'd be Captain Cook this, and breakfast was Captain Cook, lunch was Captain Cook, dinner was fucking more Captain Cook. <laughs> Anyway, we'd done it and it was hard work and very enjoyable. We got the last leg to fly home and the Qantas guy gets on the thing, said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain, Captain Cook speaking. We said, no! <laughs> but I then went to New Guinea with Ian Dunlop to the, um, what, were, what were called the Baruya. They were formerly the Cook Cuckoo, for very feared mountain tribe in the mountains of New Guinea, way, 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 way up there. And you're flying this little aeroplane overloaded with camera equipment and you know, hoping to hell you're going to make it up there through really bad weather and uh, you land on like a little billiard table up the top. And It's the only place I've ever been where there was no evidence of us. There weren't any t-shirts, there were no cups, there was no coke. There were no knives and forks, there was nothing. 
These are tribal, little tough tribal warriors. Grass skirts, bows and arrows, axes, and the women carried um, woven baskets with all the firewood or the yams or the taros or whatever, plus a child. You know, the women did all the physical and the men were the hunters. And we spent six or seven, eight weeks there recording once again for them the uh, initiation ceremony of, or the part of the initiation ceremony of these young boys who are taken away from their parents and don't really communicate with them again or even look at them again until they've become fully fledged warriors. And they're put through a series of pretty horrendous tests. And uh, so we filmed that for, for, for quite a few weeks. And it's now that you ask about Hollywood and how it might have affected what I'm doing here today. And there have been so many times on a movie set. And you know the movies here are driven by greed. They're, we're there to make money. You know, studios are there to make money by ego and, uh, and paranoia and, you know, all the bad things. Apart from all the wonderful things about it, I, you know, I love what I'm doing. I love the business and it's a good, great business. But the truth is that that's what runs it. And there'll be times on a set where maybe all hell's breaking loose and egos are running amok and people are screaming and I'm just standing back thinking, watching all of these people, thinking... I remember when I was up in the Highlands of New Guinea, there were just three of us up there. Boy, they were the days, you know. Yeah. I go back to it occasionally. And they were very special times. Yeah. I think more special now than they were then. Then it was hard work, it was great, it was exciting. I was, you know, I was young, I'm in the 30s or whatever. And now, I think if I had to do it again now, if I physically could, which I probably couldn't, but uh, I'd appreciate it a lot more. Yeah. I learned an enormous amount from George and from his partner Byron Kennedy on the Mad Max The Road Warrior because they had learned an enormous amount in the first one. They were babes in the wood on that. That's the first feature they'd made. And so it was a huge learning process for them. They made it for no money and it was a hugely successful film. So now with that experience, uh, they had a lot, of, lot more knowledge about shooting the action stuff. George knew a lot more about angles, etc., what cuts, what doesn't cut. Uh, you know, where to frame here, where to frame there. Uh, George doesn't like wasting time. He doesn't like people fucking around saying, I'm going to wait for this to be right and I've got a flare and the light's not right and I want to pluff her hair up a little bit. George just wants to get on with it and shoot it. Things that are important are important, but if they're not important to the story immediately, doesn't matter. Walk away. Like shooting any light. Doesn't matter if it's sunny, cloudy, almost raining, foggy. In action, doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't and I learned that. Be bold with a camera, shake the hell out of it, knock the shit out of it, jam it, jar it. Yeah. And uh, the wilder it could be, the better. He would come up to the tripod and shake it when we're doing simulated travel. I was sitting on the front, and if you're Mel Gibson, you're driving. And I'm here with a bungee and an Araflex camera here. To my Mel's driving the truck, this massive truck over this bumpy desert road. And Richard Merriman's with me, my camera puller, the focus puller. And we're riding and I'm hanging onto the thing to, and my eye starts to bleed. So I, I, I cannot see through the viewfinder anymore. So I close the eyepiece off and just do this. And uh, George said, yeah, there's no video. George said at the end when we stopped, how was it? I said, I don't know, George. I just aimed it and I don't know. And, and the stuff was so exciting that it sort of set a new standard for, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 set a new, what's to say, set a new bar, uh, raised the bar for, for uh, violence and action coverage after that. So. Wow. I enjoyed many years with Kennedy Miller. I stayed, they produced a lot of uh, very high quality Australian television series and I shot for two or three years with them and then I did the next Mad Max with them, The Thunderdome. And then I did... Um, Is that the one with Tina Turner? Yeah. And then I did Dead Calm, mm. which they produced and Philip Noyce directed. And George came back from uh, Witches of Eastwick. He just directed that. And he came back and he did Second Unit on Dead Calm, which I did with him. Before I went to Borneo with uh, John Milius and Nick Nolte on a film called Farewell to the King. Mm. To the jungles of Borneo. I was in... Uh, I'd been on the Great Barrier Reef for three or four months on dead calm. Hot. I went to Borneo, which is on the equator. Hot. I went to Hawaii 
to do some second unit with Nick Nolte for that film. Hot. I came to America to meet an agent for the first time. I didn't have an agent. I met Creighton Smith. This is on a Saturday. He said, I've got a few things for you to read. I've got studio people for you to meet next week, but I suggest you read this script now because they need a decision quickly. They want to replace a cameraman. All right. And the script was Cocktail with Tom Cruise and Brian Brown. And uh, so having done all that from Great Barrier Reef, etc., I was in Jamaica now for a month. The next day I was on a Learjet with my wife, Annie, thinking... Wow, this guy's good. <laughs> in Australia, we you know, take a push bike or a bus, but they're flying me to Jamaica on a Learjet? Holy hell. That was a big deal. My wife uh, loved dancing. She was a dancer, and she used to keep tap dancing. She had like a tap dancing class she used to take on Saturdays or give. And it wasn't for dancers, if they wanted to, sure, but it was for anybody. And the butcher had come along, the little old lady next door, kids and old people, younger people, middle-aged, just people who wanted a bit of fun. And Annie would teach them, and teach them little routines and stuff, and they loved it. And uh, then she got me involved, and so I went, and I was a little bit lighter then, of course, and George was, and uh, she en encouraged George to come along. So George and I would go along and we'd tap dance for like two hours on a Saturday morning. And it was fabulous fun. It was just fabulous fun. And Anne said, OK, I think, um, I think I'll get you, I'll get a little routine going for the routine going for the uh, rap party. And I said, yeah, but you won't, you won't have me in it. You're not going <laughs> to There's no way in the world I'm going to get up and tap dance, dance in front of my, yeah. my crew and, you know, the, she said, oh, I want it to be home. And I said, no, fucking way. There's no way, no way. Forget it right here and now. Cut to me in glitter, you know, <laughs> sparkle, sparkle all over me, white shoes with taps on, white pants. You went the other way. And, and George as well. well and, and he had choreographed this little piece for us. And uh, it was a huge rap party. There were like five or 600 people there. And they went absolutely bananas. They screamed. You couldn't hear the music. They screamed and screamed. And, and he had given us all a little solo, you know, about a 10 second solo each. Everyone had their own little solo. And they went crazy. They just went crazy. And uh, they wanted more. They screamed for more. You danced a solo in front of your entire crew? Yeah, yeah. But it was like. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a video of this? What? Is there a video of this somewhere? Uh, funny story. Um, they, they wanted to do a. Uh, they wanted us to do another another um, encore. They screamed. They were scream. They wouldn't stop screaming. I thought the roof was going to come down. And uh, George said no. He said no. You don't ever. Don't ever give them any more. Leave them where they are. It's fantastic. And Annie said no. Come on. They want us. So we all went up and did it again. And they went. But no, it was fantastic. The uh, production had decided not to keep the film or the film people, the behind the scenes people there that night because they didn't think there was going to be in it, anything in it, you know. It would have been fabulous. But our local butcher, who used to come to our Saturday tap dancing classes, came along with his video camera and there is a video of it. Oh, wow. <laughs> but would you, was, that, was that the genesis of, was that the thing that... It was that plus, he, there was another cameraman down there who did second unit for me on some Mad Max stuff called Bill Grimman, who was a big guy, hands this big, a big old Aussie. He was the salt of the earth and uh, I remember Bill turning up on Road Worry in the morning in the desert, it's freezing cold, freezing cold and he and I'd be there. And it's barely light, you know, the, the sky is just starting to lighten a bit, and there's a cold wind. And Bill would say, uh, G'day, mate. He said, You hungry? I'd say, Yeah, it'd be nice to have something. He said, You want a sausage? I'd say, He'd literally get a couple of sticks and light a fire, pull a couple of sausages out of his pocket, put them on a stick and cook them, and then we'd have these hot sausages. It was fabulous. But Bill had travelled extensively in the, in the Antarctic. And he'd talked to George a lot about the, the Antarctic and how beautiful it was and stuff. And so George thought about that, then he thought about the penguins, and then he thought about the tap dancing, and that's how it came about. Oh. But Annie has another fabulous story about Hugh Jackman. She discovered him. Hugh Jackman goes on Letterman or Jay Leno or somebody, and they talk about this crazy white witch from Australia. <laughs> I've heard it. <laughs> you heard it, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah.
That, that brought me to Hollywood, and then I think uh, I came over here to Young Guns, and I, I, I didn't return for about four years. I went from one to the other to the other. I was a new boy in town. I was popular. Young Guns was very successful. They liked the way it looked. I went straight on to, uh, I think I did Lonesome Dove. Simon Winsor directed main unit, and he asked me to direct second unit on Lonesome Dove. And uh, I was a bit terrified because I had to work with people like Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones, and I thought, ay, 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 ay. But it was good. I had a great experience. And, uh, uh, did you direct and shoot or just Yeah, direct? direct and shot second unit. Oh. Well, and then I did Canine, where I met uh, Jim Belushi and... Tom Hanks was in that, wasn't no, it? No, no, Jim Belushi. Yeah, and um, a producer called Chuck and Larry. IMDb. Gordon, Chuck Gordon, uh -huh. and he in fact had just done Field of Dreams with Kevin, or had just, was just about to do it with Kevin, and I think he had maybe put my name forward for Dances with Wolves, and then there were City Slickers, and so I did like, I did like six or seven westerns over a period of two or three years. <laughs> And then what, how, did, how did Dances with Wolves come about? Well, I met Kevin. I was asked to meet him, and uh, they sent a... It wasn't a script. It was about this thick. It was like two or three hundred pages to read of um, Michael Blake's book. And I read that and uh, went and met with Kevin, and uh, we, had, we had a good meeting over at Raleigh, where his office was. And Jim was there, Jim Wilson. And seemed like a good meeting, but I have no idea. I've been to lots of good meetings. So. But I haven't got the job, so you know, how do you know? But it seemed good, and then uh, we got a call a week or two later that he wanted me to do it. And I think he wanted to, you know, he knew my durability. He knew I was going to be there at the end, alive, having done those big pictures, you know, like the Mad Maxes and the Dead Calms at sea, and films he knew were difficult challenges, and films that could bring about conflicts in personalities because of endurance or, you know, you know what it's like. And he knew I was, um, well, I think he hoped I was going to be there as a friend at the end of the movie, which, which it turned out it was. You know, it was so the first time you see them in all their regalia. You know, and I'd laid a track down and lit them fairly dramatically and had a little e-fan blowing them, their hair and the feathers and did little dollies in. Well, we shot it all and it's fairly technical. People are going you know, to study their work. Wardrobe again. I look at the colour of the stuff and the makeup again. I look at the skin and the eyes and the hair, and I'm looking at light, etc., etc. We screened them at the hotel in Pierre in South Dakota. Ran the film. Kevin always played music. Always played music during dailies and whenever there was no sound recorded. And with these, of course, we didn't record sound on these wardrobe tests, so he played music, and he played things like some of the classic Western themes from theme from Lonesome Dove, um, uh, some of um, Basil Polidorus' stuff. I, he also played The Man from Snowy River, some of that music, and while you were looking at these images of these characters, you know, of Kevin and then of Mary and of uh, oh, Graham and... and it was, it was so moving, it was so powerful. Lights come on, we're all doing this, you know, we're all... No, I wasn't crying. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was so powerfully. Uh, and we knew then something was, 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 was very special. You know. But during the shoot, the shoot was just tough, it was hard. Incredibly enjoyable. Kevin was a fabulous director, producer, host. He looked after everybody. It was big for families. Families were invited. Most people had their families there. And uh, we went from the heat of summer right through to the icy winters up out of Rapid City. So how long was that shoot? Here? 20 weeks. 20 weeks. It went over. But, um, and it went over in budget. And Kevin kept being attacked by, you know, the completion guarantors who wanted him to tear pages out. And he didn't. He didn't tear a page out of that script. Not a one. We shot it all. Wow. I have to ask this question, what does it feel like to win that award? I mean, oh, that was extraordinary. Goodness yeah. me. Extraordinary. I mean, you see Well, I had no, in, in, no indication of it, no inkling of it at all until I was doing, I think I was doing City Slickers. And somebody came on the set and said that they'd heard around town that Dances with Wolves had been screened a couple of times and people were talking about Academy Awards and particularly for me, or including me. And 
I said, you know, how, how can you believe that? You know, this is for Hollywood. And then when I was nominated, that, you know, just, uh, I was in Australia, that Jim Wilson rang up, it was like one o'clock in the morning there, and and then the press starts, you know, all the phones and local press, and you become a hero down there, you know, it was very important to the country. And coming over here, realising that it's, it's speech season, and a night that I thought I'd be horrified, I thought I'd be absolutely terrified in amongst a show like that. You know, with the glamour and the glitz and me, a little country boy. <laughs> so I'm not going to handle this. What am I going to? What am I going to do if I win and have to get up there? What I, I just hope to hell my, my mouth works and my fly's done up. You know, when I get up there. But walking in there, immediately walking in and hearing the orchestra play all these fabulous themes of all the movies, seeing Billy Crystal, whom I just worked with. And uh, it was a fabulous, warm, Tom and Nicole were there, I'd worked with both of them, they were there. It was just a really great, friendly night. I, I said to people down the street, it was like a big country dance. <laughs> it was like, um, I was on a Qantas plane going back home to Sydney that I realised how important it was to my country. And, um, you know, we're sitting up, Annie and I are sitting up first class, and the, the hostess came up and said, Mr. Semler, um, do you have it with you? And I said, what do you mean? She said, the, uh, the Oscar. And I said, yeah, I've got it here, and I've got the Kodak one, and I've got the American cinema, and I've got this, and I've got an old bag full of it. She said, do you think it'll be prudent to uh, show the passengers in the plane? There's a jumbo. And I said, darling, it's like, people have been flying for 10 hours, they've got six hours to go, they're all grumpy and dirty, they want to go to the toilet, the toilet's overflowing and they're hungry and there's no room and I don't think they want someone waving a trophy around in front of their face. She said, I think you'll find it different, I think you'll find it. So I said, okay, whatever you think. So I picked it up and they went bananas. Everybody in the plane, they, <laughs> they cheered and clapped and took pictures and video and I thought, wow, this is, this really means something to the people down home, you know. Yeah. That was cool. But, hey, the Americans know how to celebrate success, I tell you, boy. Yeah. But one of, one of the best was down in Australia in, uh, I was on a scout in, in the outback, way in the outback, little town. After you won the award? After I won the award and there'd been all the press and everything like that. Hang on one second. I was, in a, I was in a scout in a small outback country town right in the middle of Australia in a semi-desert area and um, I was on my own and I dropped into a, into a petrol station to fill up the car, which I did. And it, was, it wasn't a credit card deal, I had to go and pay cash, so I went to give the guy cash. And he was a real typical Aussie, nice sort of laid back guy. I went to pay him and he said, no mate, he said, this one's on me, he said, we're Real proud of what you did for your country. He said, uh, this one's on me. Oh my so God. I thought, wow. So I drove away and I saw him in my rear vision mirror just waving. <laughs> what the fuck? That's, uh, this, is in the out this isn't even in a big city. No, way in the outback, yeah. I was also in the outback on the same scout. And I went on a cattle station, cattle ranch, cattle station down there. Maybe a million and a half acres. Huge. Red, the vast, the blessed outback, white ghost gums, blue scum, just fabulous. But I'm sitting on a veranda of this uh, homestead in the middle of this um, ranch, overlooking this horizon forever. The sun's just setting, and I'm sitting with a boss, and his three sons ride in, a couple of them on horses, one on a bike, and they were good, handsome, young Australian men in their 20s to early 30s, really really fabulous young Australian guys, you know. Yeah, but nice, you know, respectful of parents, respectful, hardworking, etc., etc. And they came in, their faces were red from all the dust, and they took their hats off, they had white foreheads, and they sat down and introduced themselves, and they said, do you want a beer? I said, sure, so we all opened a beer. And the elder of the three looked at me and he said, you're the bloke that made that film Dancing with the Wolves, aren't you? Dancing. Yeah, I said, um, yeah. He said, yeah, we, we saw you on the telly. So we saw you on the telly. He said, I've got a bone to pick with you. And I said, ah, what's this? What's this? No one's ever said this. Okay, what's, uh, what's the bone? What do you want to do? What do you want to say? And he said, well, and he looked at his brothers. He said, those buffalo, he said, they all had ear tags in, didn't they? Didn't they? 
And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact. He said, I told you, I saw the bloody ear tags to his brothers. He said, yeah. And I, I said, you're right, they did. You know. And it's funny because I didn't ever see them and I still haven't seen them. But he was a cattle man in the middle of the outback whose life was cattle and he watched the buffalo and he saw the ear tags. And I said, mate, if we had to take them out, it would cost, I don't know, maybe $50 per head. To, I don't know to take them out. I have no idea. It might be less. But there's 3,000 buffalo. Then you've got to put them back in again. What's that going to cost? And I have never seen them. I've never seen them. And I watched the film today and I haven't seen them. So, uh, but it's a nice story. But the Outback Critic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't ever consider myself as running a big outfit of like an army of guys. Uh, they're, they're all, these people are all my friends, you know, we all work together and I, I consider us all equal, pretty much. They all call me boss and whatever you want and I have the final say, obviously, but uh, it's just a great team. You know, I don't find it difficult to be in charge of all those people. They all know what they're doing better than I do. Tony Rivetti knows how to load a camera better than I do, knows how to run the Genesis. Jimmy Gilson knows how to put power on a 12K HMI. Bear knows how to fly a 60 by 40 grip. I don't. So, you know, I respect them for, for their leadership in their particular fields. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's a certain amount of management. I, I find that... Um, I guess I guess one of the major parts of being a cinematographer, and I know George Miller loves it, and he loves Australian camera crews. He said because the crews he's worked with have like a circle of grace around the camera. There's no yelling and screaming. He had a couple of bad experiences, I think, and I don't really want to talk about that and how bad they were. I don't know, but. Um, to me, when he says that, he means that it was a DP with your crew that you've selected. That's operator. Key one is the operator, focus puller. That you create a harmony around a set for everyone else, particularly for actors. So when an actor comes on a set, he or she is made to feel better, probably. You show them respect, whether they're assholes or not. And I haven't worked with any actors who's really assholes. Oh, hang on, yes, I did, but I won't mention that. <laughs> Just to keep harmony and to keep a fairly quiet around the camera, keep a quiet atmosphere around there, so that actors can work without being distracted. And I had a I had a fire an operator once, and it was probably a good thing because he went on to be a DP because of that, which was great. And he was a very good operator, but it was on a comedy where. Um, the operator at the end of a take would go, ah, fuck. And it was something he might have done, and he was a very good operator. He might have just made a little glitch or something. But he'd do it quite a lot, and he'd cut the camera off and do this. And you can imagine the actor up front going, what happened? What did, I, what did I do? So the actor asked me to get rid of him, so I did. And, I, you know, I didn't want to. But, um, and then it was fine. We had an, an operator in there who... As, as Mel said to George, she said, I always look to Dean. And I said, I know immediately when he pulls his eye away from that eyepiece whether the take was good or not. And th I think that's a good uh, quality in an operator. And I know most of the good operators do that. Most of the ones I've worked with anyway. And we were doing a film in the Outback. And I was asked to do a... I was asked to interview the local projectionist to have him to do our dailies every night, our rushes. And so I did, I went and met this guy, and he was a true blue Australian. Australian as a, as they say, Australian as a shit sandwich. And he was... <laughs> That's no explanation. And, and I said to him, uh, what, do you, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a butcher during the week, uh, but on the weekends I... I do the movies at the clubs. There are two clubs. There's an, 
like a, a veteran returned servicemen's club and a football club. They're both clubs that have poker machines. They have cheaper drinks and they have food, more family orientated rather than pubs, you know, and they have shows and they have movies. They have 16 mil movies. And I said, what projectors have you got? And he said, well, the one at the RSL club, he said, it's a little brown one. He said, it's about that big. I said, oh, that's what brand is. He said, oh, I don't know what brand it is, but he says, it's about that big with the big reels, you know. I said, oh. I said, what about the other one at the footy club? He said, well, that's a big blue one. It's much bigger. The reels are the same, but it's much bigger. I said, all right. I said, which one, <laughs> which one do you prefer? He said, I like the blue one at the footy club. He said, that's my favourite. I said, why is that? And he's serious. He said, that's because I can put my pie on it and it keeps it hot for half the movie. I said, interesting, all right, that, sound, that sounds a really good projector. Uh, well, you better come and have a look at ours. And I'd set up our, we had an Italian uh, double head projector, big 35 mil, you know, it stands five feet high. Reels like this, sound, 35 mil sound plus 35 mil film, big lens out the front, anamorphic. And I took him in and we were actually in a barn, in an old tin shed in the country, in this farm. And I took him in and said, well, there. He said, what's that? I said, that's the projector that we'll be doing our, you know, our rushes on every night. Oh, fuck, he said, and he walked out and left, and I never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it myself. I threaded it up every night and did it myself. But, uh... Oh, my God. <laughs> Out of all the movies you've done, is, is, is this almost, is it, would it be the same question as asking who's your favorite child? Are you kidding? No, ask me. What's the favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Apocalypto, without doubt. Really? Mm -hmm. well, why? It was, um, it was most enjoyable every day. It was most, and I think it gets back to the leadership and Mel, and he was, he was so smart, he was such a good director. He was such a fun guy. He was tough. Um, but every, every day, and with the genesis, of course, at the end of every day, we're shooting under horrendous conditions a lot of the time. And at the end of the day, we would see our stuff and we'd think, yeah, that's just, that's great, you know. Every day, every day was just fantastic. It was very rewarding, very satisfying. I said to him when we wrapped after however many months it was, on the afternoon we wrapped, we're shooting underwater stuff, I think, in that cenote hole. And I said, if you want to start again Monday, I guarantee you I'll be here and the whole crew will be here and we'll go through it all again. And I would have. It was just, it was a wonderful experience. And the end result was very special to me. I think it's some of the best stuff I've ever done. Yeah. And I was flabbergasted when the ASC nominated me for the ASC award that year because the first time a digital film, all digital, had been nominated. And that to me with, the, you know, the gentlemen at the ASC, there's a lot of diehard filmmakers there and film users. Right? And it just blew me away that they had, um, it, it blew me away that they recognised this film the way they did and, 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 uh, and it gave me the nomination. It yeah. was a, a huge tribute, not to me so much as the system. Yeah. And of course me using it, but it was, uh, it was fabulous. Yeah. Don Henderson from Kodak in Chicago provided us all the film for Dances with Wolves. And he came up to me one day and he had this little box. He said, look, we're making these. Oh, what is it? He said, it's a, it's a disposable consumer panoramic camera. Disposable. Cardboard. I said, wow, that's fantastic. What a great idea. Panoramic. Disposable. That's a great idea. He said, we'd like to, like to run some shots through. I said, sure. So I, I kept it. And I did some shots, you know, beautiful skies and prairies and things. And uh, in the meantime, I said, Don, do you mind if you give me another 20 or 30 of these, I'll give them to my crew. And they can all go out and take pictures whenever they want. And I'll, I'll judge them at the end of the picture and give a prize to whoever I think's the best picture. You know, sure. So they send all these other 30 cameras down, 20 or 30. In the meantime, mine had gone in to Chicago there was no commercial processing yet, it had to be done by Kodak. So they processed them, printed them, sent them back to me. And I looked at them and they looked like shit, they were terrible. There was no information there. I looked at the negative and silly me, thinking the negative would have been like a big 35mm negative, 
was a small slice out of the centre of a 35mm negative blown up. So all that other film around the edge was waste, was waste, was useless. All the chemicals required to make it and process it was waste. And uh, I was really pissed off. And uh, But more pissed off was my camera assistant, Lee Blassingame, who himself was a great stills guy. And he would take, uh, you know, two and a quarter, eight by ten, panoramic uh, 120s. It was a, a really good stills, black and white photographer. And um, he got he got really pissed off. He, anyway, we all took our roles. Everybody shot their roles and sent them to Kodak. And it was like a month later, maybe I get a call from Don Henderson saying, oh, "Dino, we got the uh, we developed all the all the little films and we've got them all printed." And uh, he said, "Some really nice stuff there." He said, "But um, I'd like to talk to you about one role in particular." I said, what's the problem? He said, oh, it's not a problem so much. He said, uh, every shot is of a horse's dick. I said, say again? He said, yeah, every, every, every shot is like a horse's dick. Okay, Doc, thanks for the information. I knew it was Blaster. I knew it was him. And I went up to him and said, it was you, wasn't it? He said, yes, it was me. And uh, he said, I gave it to a wrangler and said, every time a horse goes, gets a hard on, turn the camera on its side and take a picture, nice and close. So that's what he did, and that's, that was Blaster. <laughs> I find out two years ago, this was 18 years after Dances with Wolves, the wrangler who took the picture was my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
spritzed all the way down and gave the lady down the end a little bit more because it's going to be a while before we got to her. <laughs> so we do the shot, Steadicam pushes all the way down, people look good, they're sweaty, pushing in. We get to the end seat and there's our leading lady, but the lady next to her had dyed hair in the black tie. <laughs> I'd run down like this black waterfall right down her face. And I said, right, there's your bottles. I'll stick to what I do best. Oh, my God. <laughs>